good morning, everyone that's out here this morning. Give me a horn blow if you're here today. Man, y'all, we had to get these blow, blow horns when you get back in the building. You're still blowing my air horns like we did football games. Anyway, good morning. Happy Memorial Day to our Open Door Church and our online ODC family. And to those of you that are here to worship with us live in our drive-in worship service. So good to be with you. We're excited about what the Lord has been saying to us over the past several weeks. last week. It looks like things may be coming to an end, so stay tuned for updates this week via our text, Facebook, email, and Instagram. The Bible says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Today's Memorial Day, a federal holiday for the United States, honoring and mourning the military personnel who have died while serving the United States Armed Forces. The holiday is now observed the last Monday, which will be tomorrow, um, so make sure that you uh, uh, take a time of uh, quietness and a time of memorial for those people that died and gave them li their lives for the freedom we have. If you're a first-time visitor here today or first-time viewer anywhere, we welcome you, so please connect with us at 757-320-5615. That's 757-320-5615. Just type that in, send it to the church, and we can be sure that we stay up in touch with you throughout this entire uh, pandemic that we're going through. Uh, and also, we'll be able to let you know when we're going to be back in the house of the Lord again. Another big thank you to everyone that has continued to support ODC with your generosity. We cannot thank you enough. It's been amazing that the contributions have came in during this entire time and uh, have been able to meet every need that we've had. Um, at the end of the service, as you exit to my left out this driveway over here, not the one you came in, but a different driveway, there will be uh, receptacles there for you to give to the ushers if you have any offering after the service. We just want to tell you we love you so much. You are the best. Uh, if you want to give, you can also give um, via online, 757-320-5555, 757-320-5555. I know if Becky Denny's is around somewhere, she usually put these numbers in for me. You go to our website and give there, odcsuffolk.com forward slash give, mail, bank, bill pay, whatever, there's all kind of ways to do it. You can drop it by the office. At some of you have brought some today. Uh, we will also be receiving food during the week if you have uh, food for the needy in the neighborhood. Also, we're still partnering with the neighborhood um, no local restaurants and also with uh, the city of Suffolk um, providing meals on Tuesdays and Thursdays every week. So if you want to help with that, distribute the food, meet some people, greet some people, be out here at about quarter to three on Tuesday or Thursday. So right now we're going to um, ask you to get ready to worship, welcome the worship team with Brandis and uh, we've got Michael on the drums, we've got Tucker over here singing with us. And also if you have some time this week that you'd like to give to uh, cleaning the church, we have some cleaning to do around here. Uh, the building does get dirty, it does get dusty, and uh, so we need you to come out and help us. Just give us a call, we'll give you some, some menial tasks to do. So let's um, welcome, welcome Brandis as she comes to lead some songs, okay? If you want to get out and stand by your car, or stand in front of your car, six feet, stay apart, and just worship that way, because you'd be sitting for a little while anyway, so just get on out of the car. All right, good morning, everyone. All right, we're going to celebrate the goodness of God. me 
on it, sing with me. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let, come on, yeah. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Sing 
of the goodness of God all my life. Come on, let's sing it. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. Every path that I am made for, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. I love your voice. Led me through the fire in darkest nights. You were close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. Oh, I have lived in the goodness of God. Fight this wind a little bit this morning. Oh, that's pretty cool. Looks 
Well, listen. I want to talk to you a little bit more this morning about waiting. I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit this morning. My wife kind of got us way down the road last week talking about the Holy Spirit and the day of Pentecost. And we just need to we want to back up just a little bit this morning and kind of begin to really establish where we came from and where we're going to go next week is Pentecost Sunday, and I, I believe it's going to be a really great, great day for us. Since Lent began, we've been building this message for quite a few weeks now, probably like 12 to 13, maybe maybe many as 14. And we talked about how Lent was a, a built for a purpose, for a reason. It was to, to lengthen out the time of the past. Etching in the hearts and the spirits and the minds of people so that they wouldn't forget about all that Jesus Christ went through. And then we began to talk about the, uh, the memories that were made through it. Then we talked about the commentary of the death of Jesus and what went on prior to his death and what went on uh, during his death on the cross, things that happened there. Uh, the burial, we talked about what happened after the burial, after he was resurrected. All this stuff is very important. They're very important components. They're like pieces to a big puzzle. And we talked about that, that, you know, if you're going to put a puzzle together, you have to put all the pieces in. You can't leave one piece out, else the puzzle is incomplete. And we talked about the 40 days after his resurrection and, and how the Bible says in the book of Acts 1, it said that he, he literally walked around doing doing incredible things, teaching infallible and doing infallible miracles and proofs of his ministry that he was really alive because uh, it was an establishment, another 40 days. And we show that in that particular place in the book of Acts chapter 1, we talked about how that he talked about a promise, the promise of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to begin to build a little bit more on that this morning, that the Holy Spirit would empower you, would help you, would, it would be like uh, an engine that uh, that is installed in you, but you have to have gas for the engine for the engine to run, or like um, you have to have a key to start the engine. So the Holy Spirit is like gas; it's like um, a key, or like a password to open your computer up so it actually will function and operate. But in this case, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. You see, we in ourselves are just a vessel. We're an empty vessel, and we need power. We need a key. We need energy. We need some sort of a source for us. We need a password to, to release us so that we can be um, operational. So he talks about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit was going to come and empower them. Just like gas powers a car, like the keys open the potential of an engine to run. You see... We have to have the Holy Spirit. We have to have some power. We have to have some assistance, as I heard a guy talk about yesterday, because we in ourselves aren't able to produce what we really need without this assistance of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus Christ, at that juncture, he ascends to heaven. He goes up, and they see him leave. And, of course, obviously, here they are. They're probably fighting discouragement again, just like they did when he was crucified, like he was buried. Here he, he's gone again, and... The scripture says it just kind of stood around looking up. It's not up there. It's down here. But I'm going to send you a promise. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And I want you you. I want it to really begin to make you hunger and thirst for the Holy Spirit like you never had before. So he tells them to wait. Here we go, waiting again. They've been waiting and waiting and waiting for something to happen, for something to manifest. And here he is telling them to wait again. 
And see, we're moving towards Pentecost Sunday. It's a Sunday that the Christian world celebrates. They call it Pentecost Sunday. It doesn't sound crazy when the world celebrates Pentecost Sunday, but when we as Pentecostals, or people that believe in the gifts of the Spirit, talked about it, people looked at us like cross-eyed. But I want us to get to the place that people don't look at Pentecost cross-eyed, but they look at it straight up. They look at it upright. They look at it as something that we should really yearn and hunger for. Not only that there would be a, a Pentecost Sunday, but there would be Pentecost in our lives every single day. Can you say amen to that? Every single day. That we just don't have it reserved for one time of the year. One experience that we might have, but that we would be people that would really be after Pentecost, after the power of the Holy Spirit, after the promise of the Holy Spirit. So I want to set us up for next week. I want to look at a few verses to set us up for next week that talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus, as we said earlier on, he talked about a lot of things in the beginning of his ministry that was going to happen at the end of his ministry. He talked about his death early. He talked about forgiveness early. But he always also talks about this baptism of the Holy Spirit in the very beginning. Before he talks about his death. Before he talks about his burial. Before he talks about forgiveness. Before he talks about anything else. He talks about the promise of the Father. He talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus Christ, when he was baptized in water by John... When he came up out of the water, the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord descended like a dove and hovered there and it said, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. But John made a statement in there as well. He said, I'm baptizing you with water, but he's going to baptize you with what? The Holy Ghost and fire. There's the first mention of that. First mention is always very important because if it's said one time, it's got to happen later on. So Jesus Christ was setting them up, telling them, putting something in their heart. Now, we don't know everything that Jesus said his entire life because they couldn't record every single word he said because, uh, according to the Bible, there wouldn't be enough um, books in the world to contain everything but what he did and what he said. But he says this to them, and no doubt this baptism of the Holy Spirit resonated within them, something that was conveyed to them, something that was talked about. I want to read that verse in Matthew chapter 3, 11. What John says, this declaration, I indeed baptize you with water into repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Have you really ever thought about that verse? Or we just run across it as part of the water baptism? Water baptism is important, but the Holy Spirit baptism is important. If we move on to the book of John, chapter 7, we find in 37 and 39, the book of John 7, 37 and 39, you have to work a little bit with your phones or your Bibles, not the screens to look at. Jesus says this, he said, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst... Let him come and drink. Let him come unto me and drink. And he that believes on me, as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. He's setting them up. He's telling them something. He's telling them something that they need to hunger for, they need to thirst for, they need to yearn for, and it was something that would change their life, something that would cause something to happen inside of them. But notice what he says in verse 39, if you're reading along. He said, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they believe on should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not glorified yet. He's saying there's something that's going to be available after I'm glorified, after I leave this earth. And I want you to hunger for that. I want you to thirst for that. It's going to change your life. It's going to cause something to get stirred up inside of you. He goes on to say in John 14, 
The writer writes, this is, these things I've spoken unto you, being present with you. He's talking to them face to face, personally, He's saying, listen, this is something that you should really pay attention to. He said, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Obviously, it wasn't there yet. Obviously, it was something that was somewhere that had to be dispatched. It said, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I've said unto you. The Comforter, the Holy Spirit, teach you. Bring things to remembrance. Help you in your life. See the, the word comforter there. Spoken of as the Holy Spirit, but the, the Greek word is paraclete. It means the one beside you. In essence, Jesus was saying, listen, I'm not going to leave you. I'm still going to be beside you via the Holy Spirit. This word also means to comfort, to bring, to come to one's aid, to help, to assist, to advocate for, to mediate for, to intercede for, to console, and to help you in life. Can I ask you something? Do you need help? Do you need someone to advocate for you? Do you need someone to intercede for you? Do you need someone to console you? Do you need someone to comfort and to help you? I do. Come on. I do. And if you're honest with yourself, there you go. If you're honest with yourself, you all need help. I need help. I need assistance. I need a comforter. I need a consoler. When there's no one else around, I have the Holy Spirit. Come on. I have the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm not going to be here physically with you, but I'm leaving you the Holy Spirit. I'm leaving you a power source. Come on. I'm leaving you a key. I'm leaving you some gas. I'm leaving you some energy. I'm leaving you some assistance. I'm leaving you an advocate. I'm leaving you an aid to help you in your troubles. Man, when I began to read that, I began to see that in the scriptures after I got saved. I said, wait a minute. This is like a different, this is different. I kind of like to describe it this way. You know, I gave my life to Jesus in a dormitory room at East Carolina University, 1976. Matter of fact, I got a picture of it this past week. I had to go down and take care of some business for my mom, and I took Tucker with me. And Tucker saw the place where I, I got saved. He took pic I got pictures of the windows where we looked looked out there in the windows there. But that's a great memory of where I got saved there, where I, I believe for salvation, where I believe that God cleansed me of my sins. But you know what? I didn't realize there was something just more than just a pass to get to heaven. I didn't know about the Holy Spirit. The church I was raised in, we didn't even talk about the Holy Spirit. We read the Bible, we talked about the Bible, we learned Bible verses and heard some teaching and some preaching, but we didn't hear about the Holy Spirit, we heard about getting saved, but not the Holy Spirit. We didn't talk about that. That was kind of like off limits. I don't know why, because it was right there in the Bible. I picked the Bible up and I, I see the word Holy Spirit all in the Bible. And then I start reading. I see this thing by John. I see what Jesus said. And I, I see um, all these references of the Holy Spirit. I'm thinking, what in the world's going on? Why, why aren't we talking about this? So I began to get really hungry. I began to get thirsty. And then in the book of John, chapter 20, I love this verse. He said, when he had said this to them, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. I mean, there's got, there was something extra here. There was something more. So I said, you know what? Getting saved is like getting a two-wheel drive car. But getting filled with the Holy Ghost is like getting a four-wheel drive car. It's like getting something that's got double the power, more energy, more strength, and can get you through stuff that ordinarily you're not going to get through. So I want to talk to you this morning a little bit more about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. My wife kind of broached it on last Sunday. I want to challenge you to think about the Holy Spirit this week. I want to challenge you 
to pray about the Holy Spirit this week. I want you to think about this scripture in the book of Acts chapter 1, 4 and 5. They've assembled themselves together with them. And they commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but wait for the promise. Wait for the promise. You've probably been waiting for this message to really kind of end. So we get to the point of the thing. He said, but wait for the promise. Which you've heard of me in John, in Luke, in Matthew. You heard about this baptism of the Holy Spirit. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days since. Jesus Christ makes reference to that verse that John stated in the book of Matthew. You've been baptized in water. There's salvation in your life. I had been baptized in water. There was salvation in my life. My name was even on the roll books of the church. But I hadn't gotten the Holy Ghost yet. I had not received that part of the promise. Now, there's a lot of argumentation about this, about when it happens, when you get it. Well, I'm just saying that there's a Pentecostal experience in the book of Acts chapter 2. You can read it for yourself. He said, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. I remember my wife talking last week about when she got saved, she said she had not even heard about the Holy Spirit. And someone, her sister told her about it. And there's a scripture in the book of uh, Acts that says the same thing. They said, we heard of John's baptism, but we don't know what you're talking about. We've never heard of the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want to challenge you to pray about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This week. This week. Notice what Jesus said. You shall receive power. You shall receive an energy. You shall receive an activation. You shall receive an assistance. You shall receive an aid, a consoler, a comforter, one that's going to get down in the nitty-gritty with you and help you through life. Come on. You just can't do this by yourself. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want you to hear that. Say it wherever you're at. Say it. If you're watching online, say it. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's different than the water. Say to yourself, it's different than the water. I'm talking about something different. You see, this outpouring that I'm talking about was prophesied in the book of Joel, which, which Peter goes right to that scripture in the book of Joel, chapter 2, 28 to 29. He goes right to that. He begins to remind them of what was said previously. But can I tell you something? Sometimes we don't understand. We don't get the time lapses sometimes. Even myself just kind of forget about it sometimes. It's like this just didn't happen just a few months or a few, just a few years before Acts 2. This happened, listen, 750 plus years before Pentecost is when Joel prophesied this. So there's been a lot of waiting going on for this outpouring. 750 years before Acts chapter 2 it was prophesied that what happened in Acts chapter 2 was going to happen. That's pretty incredible. I think sometimes that we don't realize that sometimes it takes a little while for prophetic words to come to pass. and Sometimes there's a lot of twists and turns and all that. Some people think it's going to happen right now or it should happen instantaneously. But I want to read this verse to you. And it shall... And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now, he says, Some flesh is at all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And the young men are going to see visions. This, this is what I'm talking about. It literally touches every scope of humanity. He said, even upon your servants and upon your handmaids in those days, I'll pour my spirit. It, it, there was no respect to persons in this outpouring. 
There's no respect of persons in this outpour, no matter if you're big or small, where you work, where you don't work, man or woman, color, it doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit is for everyone. Your wife's for everyone because everyone needs the Holy Spirit. Come on. We all need the Holy Spirit. We all need some help in our life. Listen, the scripture talks about David said, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. I need help, people. Come on. I cannot navigate life without the Holy Spirit. I cannot be a good Christian without the Holy Spirit. I cannot be a good husband without the Holy Spirit. I can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. Come on, I can't. And neither can you. You might, you might think you can, but you really can't. So I want to challenge you, if you've been living without the Holy Spirit, try living with the Holy Spirit. Come on. Try inviting the Holy Spirit into your life to help you in your life. It's not just words on a page, people. It's not just preaching from the pulpit. It's not just a bunch of songs that we sing. It's not verses that we memorize. We need the energy, the power of the Holy Spirit to help us understand and to live the right way. Come on. You see, when I first got saved, I knew there was more, automatically knew there was more. Because, you see, I began to read the Bible. I mean, I was like a vacuum cleaner reading the Bible, just, just, just taking it in as fast as I could. Reading everything I could read. Just the Bible. I wouldn't read any other books, just reading the Bible. Just read, 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 read. And things began to open up to me, and I said, why are we doing this? I mean, like I'd be reading the book of Psalms and started talking about clapping your hands. And it started talking about shouting. And it talked about rejoicing. It talked about cymbals and all kind of noisy instruments. It talked about dancing. And I'm th thinking, why are we doing this? This is all right here in the, in the heart of the book, in the book of Psalms. Why are we doing this? Somewhere, somehow, somebody sidetracked us. Somebody got us on a detour, folks. Come on. Because I think that the Bible is just as real today as it was when these people were living it, when these people were preaching, when these people were teaching and are writing and are recording it. I believe the same Bible to then is it should be the same Bible today. You know, I can tell y'all don't want to hear this. I can tell you just want to kind of take what you want. But the Bible is total. It's complete. And everything in it is for us. Everything was written for us to help us, to help prove us, to help show us, to help us live life, to help us know what is available to us to have an abundant life. Well, I said, why are we doing this? Why are we raising our hands? That was really fun. Raise your hands in church. Wow. Clap your hands. Shout. Rejoice. Dance. I think, man, this is great. No hangover the next day. No wondering about what you did the night before, or who you were with, or where you were at, or what you did. None of that, none of that was, none of that was concerning anymore. Because I was worshiping the Lord, I was shouting, I was clapping, I was rejoicing in Him, making His praise known. I thought, where is this boldness that we should have? Where is this, where is this vocalness and this voice that we should have? Where is this freedom and liberty that we should have in the Spirit? Where is it at? Why don't we have that? You see, I remember growing up in the little church. I was in North Carolina in the country. I even showed Tucker that church as well. I was kind of boasting about my heritage and where I came from and what my life's line looked like. But somebody came into the church. I remember I was a little, a little guy. And he came from a Pentecostal church, a Pentecost Holiness Church in the next town over that he came to our revival, our choir revival. And the preacher said something, the evangelist said something, it was really good, it was, it was fiery, and the guy back in the back said, Amen. Everybody looked around at that guy like he lost his mind. Like, you don't talk in church, you don't say anything in church, you're supposed to be quiet in church, this is a, a, like a funeral. You know what I'm talking about. I see her, hear some of you laughing. <laughs> Ch 
Church should be the furthest thing from a funeral. Come on. Church should be, if, if you won't get offended at this, church, church should be like a party. You know, I was, I was thinking about this song a few weeks ago. It said, ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because the Holy Par Ghost party what, don't stop. Is that what it, the way it goes? But I think that we should sing that sometimes. Ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because the Holy Ghost party don't stop. Boom. I mean, it's, it's a pretty cool song. Maybe it wakes some of y'all up. I don't know. And so I began to ask, and, and, and the preacher lived right next door to me, and I said, I began to ask, why, why don't we do this? Why haven't we been encouraged to worship the Lord clapping our hands? Why haven't we, we, we been encouraged to worship the Lord raising our hands? Why haven't we been encouraged to shout in the house of the Lord and to worship like this? Why? When it's clearly in the Bible. Clearly. I said, why? Do you know what? Some people don't have an answer to that question. Or they might say, well, it was just for that day. Well, that was Old Testament. Well, I want to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you with the verse in a minute. Think about this. I'm going to challenge you to rethink what you've been taught, what you've heard, what you've, been, what you've learned. You see, in the book of Matthew chapter 5, I love this verse. It says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You see, I was hungry. And I was thirsty. And as I was hungry, God began to fill me with his word. And I was thirsty, and God began to quench my thirst. But this is the important thing about it. I wasn't raised in a church like our pastor here. I wasn't raised in any other church that believes in the gifts of the Spirit, or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I wasn't raised in a, a Pentecostal church of any name. I wasn't raised in an apostolic church of any name. I wasn't raised in an Assembly of God church of any name. I wasn't raised in a spirit-filled church because we didn't know what they were of any name. I wasn't raised in a charismatic church of any name. I wasn't raised in that kind of a church. I got saved. I acknowledged my salvation in the church I grew up in to let them know what I did because I believed in a public profession of faith. I wanted the community to know where I'd been and where I'm at now. But as I began to read the Bible, the Lord began to reveal to me what I had never been taught and what I didn't even know existed because it had been covered to me. It had been hidden from me. No one shared it with me. I don't know why they don't share it. I don't know why they don't broach the subject. But I got hungry and I got thirsty. And where I was at church, the only church I knew, the only church I knew to go to was the little church I grew up in. But someone invited me to a meeting one night. It was about a real, it was really about a bunch of people that were closet Pentecostals. I mean, really, it's just truth. And I began, I shared this with you later on if you want to ask me about it. But it was a group of people that, that got together, and someone would come and tell them how the Holy Spirit came into their life and challenge others to believe in it and accept it and receive it. The hunger for it, the thirst for it. So someone invited me to this particular meeting. I'd been saved about two weeks from that dormitory room in East Carolina University. And I went to this meeting and the guy shared a little bit. And it, was, it was interesting and I never forget my cousin had gotten saved about the same time I, time I did. Just almost simultaneously. And they said, well, we're going to have prayer. And they had a prayer room. Go to the prayer room. And she goes to the prayer room. And I'm feeling this real stirring in my heart about the prayer room. But I'm just, I got my head buried in my face. I'm just buried. I'm not looking. I'm not paying attention. I don't want to really you know, kind of make a move here, you know, kind of scared, kind of embarrassed, maybe intimidated. So my cousin goes off to the prayer room, and she comes back out. And it looked like she was on fire. 
I mean, she was glowing. She was smiling ear to ear. And I said, I don't know what happened to her, but I, I need to go to that prayer room. I went to that prayer room, folks. And that's where I got really juiced up. That's where I got the password. That's where I got the key. That's where I got the motivation. That's where I got the assistance that I needed in life. And my life has never been the same since. I would have, I'd probably still be where I was at. I probably would, I wouldn't even be here today if that hadn't happened because that thrust me, that catapulted me into the desire to preach and the desire to go to Bible college and the desire to, to, to do ministry for the Lord. But folks, you've got to be hungry. My wife shared that she'd gotten prayed for and she was at home by herself and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes upon her. We can give you story after story after story that people had been prayed for in the church and asked for the Holy Spirit, and they'd be doing something that wasn't even related, weren't even thinking about it, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit would come upon them. And things would change at that point. You see, I, I'm not a cessationist. And you might say, what is the heck is a cessationist? I'm going to give you the definition. <laughs> It's the Christian theology. It's the view that miraculous gifts of the Spirit, such as healing tongues and prophetic revelation, that pertain to the apostolic area of the first century church, serve a, a purpose, a one-time purpose, that was unique to establishing the early church. In other words, it's just going to be the liftoff for the church. And passed away before the scripture canon was closed or done or written. It is contrasted with continuationism, which is the view that miraculous gifts are normative, are the standard, that have not, they have not ceased and are available to us, the believer, today. Again, I'm not a cessationist. I do not believe the baptism of the Holy Spirit was only for the day of Pentecost, that one day, or that miracles and gifts of the Spirit have passed away. I don't believe any of that. I'm a continuationist. I want to read a scripture to you. And the people say they believe the Bible. I don't understand how they can argue with this one verse if they believe the Bible. Now, if you believe the Bible, if you have your window open or sunroof, let me see your hand. If you believe the Bible. All right, if I can't see your hand, you can have a sunroof and just stick your hand out. If you believe the Bible, blow your horn. So we've established that I think pretty close to 100% of the people here believe the Bible. Those of you that are watching online on Facebook, I believe and I hope that you believe in the Bible. If you don't believe in the Bible, come on, if you don't believe in the Bible, here is a verse for you to think about. The book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 8. The book of Hebrews, 13, verse 8. I need somebody, if, if you can post that on Facebook, then please post it right now. Hebrews 13, 8. It's a very simple passage. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. If Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then why would not you believe everything in the Bible it was true yesterday, true today, and true forever? How can a believer in the Bible, a believer in Jesus Christ, refute that verse and, and even disclaim that certain parts of the Bible are not for today? I don't get it. It's that simple. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eleven verses, eleven words in English. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's irrefutable, folks. Come on. It's an eternal statement. Come on. Beginning, the middle, and the end. I want to challenge you to begin to believe the Bible for what it says not for what someone told you it said. 
There was a group of people in the book of Acts called Bereans that they would study to find out if what was being said was true or not. We need to stop just assuming things, come on, are true and finding out if things are true. Now, if you read the Bible and you start from the book of Acts chapter 1, you read Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way at least to chapter 19, you will find places where the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens time and time and time again, up to 30 to 40 years, maybe 50 years after the day of Pentecost. So that wasn't just a one-time thing. It happened over and over and over again. Enough times to declare that it had enough witness of the events happening that it was true. See, if it just happened in the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 1, we could say, well, that's just kind of an anomaly. But it's not an anomaly. Next week is the day of Pentecost that we celebrate Pentecost Sunday. It's a celebration of Acts chapter 2, but it's also a celebration for what catapulted, what energized, what keyed, what coded the church to become what it was in the early days. And you can read historically, if you're a person as a historian, as an historian, you can read historical facts where this same event of Acts chapter 2 happens Time after time after time, after it seemed to have fallen asleep and died, and all of a sudden it would resurrect itself. Why? Because it's the power of God we're talking about. It's the Holy Spirit. The grave couldn't hold Jesus in the ground, and neither can anybody. No system can hold the Holy Spirit in the ground. Come on. It's not possible. We cannot restrain it. We need the Holy Spirit. I'm convinced, and some of you here, you're not living by the Holy Spirit. You're living by another spirit. You're living by your flesh, your own carnal spirit. And it gives you a lot of trouble, and it causes a lot of embarrassment to you, and it causes you to see things and to deal with things in a very fleshly, carnal, earthly way. But the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance to you things that you need to call on to help you through your situations. Your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will check you when you get ready to go off track. Spirit to help you. You see, there's times when my wife can say something that challenges me. There's times when people say stuff that challenges me. Makes me kind of rethink things. There's things I hear that challenge me. There's things I read that challenge me. But there's times when people can't challenge me. I don't listen. When things don't challenge me, I'm not paying attention. When things I read don't challenge me because I'm not, I'm not really uh, comprehending it. Then the Holy Spirit challenges me. And then I get it. Then it makes sense to me. Then it gets me back in my lane. Come on. Because you know what? A lot of us live outside of our lane without the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm talking about, right? You know they got these new cars now? These new cars. I see a few new cars out here. They got these new cars now. If you're driving down the road, if you get close to one of the lines on the out on on the on the side or to the middle it'll begin to nudge you back in. That is a weird feeling. That is a weird feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm not in control. Someone else is in control. Can I tell you all something? You need the same kind of mechanism in your life. You need something to help you stay in the lines. And you know, you know what that something is? It's the Holy Spirit. When you start moving to the center, crossing over, and get ready to have a head-on collision, he pushes you back over. When you get ready to run into the ditch and flip the car over, he, or get stuck in the mud, he pushes you back. He's the one that keeps you in the line. So why would not you want him as an integral part of your life? Would it just feel so weird? About two years ago, we were trying out vehicles, 
And I didn't know all the apparatus on these particular vehicles. So we were driving this vehicle along, and, and I got to a, to a stop sign, and I, it felt like the thing was jumping when I hit the gas. Well, it would turn off when you got to the, to the stop sign. I'm thinking, what the heck? Is this, is this, this is a brand new vehicle. Is, is it okay? And then I'm driving down the road, it starts happening, and it starts moving me around. I'm thinking, wow, this thing's out of line or something. Is there something wrong with the tires? Well, I didn't know what was going on, and, and then I found out what was happening. And my wife was driving the vehicle, and the same thing was happening to her. She said, I don't like that at all. I said, well, you know what, honey? I said, there's a button on the dash. You can cut it off. If you don't want it to keep you in line, just cut it off. If you don't want it to stop at the stop sign, just cut it off. I think sometimes some people have just cut off the apparatus that's going to help them stay in line. It's going to help them stay in the lane. It's going to help them run properly. I want to challenge you to cut it back on. To cut it back on. If you put the Holy Spirit on the back burner and, and live like you want to live, put it back on the front burner. Get it back involved in your life because some of you didn't start that way. If we would take a, if we could take a picture, or had a picture we could pull back up of how you were or what was going on in your life when you received the Holy Spirit years ago, and what you are today and how you act today, what's going to go? What's it going to look like? How are you going to be portrayed? Is it going to even match? Is it unrecognizable? I want to challenge you to read. Chapter Acts, chapter 2 of the book of Acts. And I want you to read all the way to the chapter 19 this week. Like the first seven, ten verses of 19. Read Acts 2 to Acts 19. Make note of Acts chapter 8. Make note of Acts chapter 10. Acts 19, I believe there's another chapter. I cannot call them up to mind right now which one it is. But I want you to read those chapters. And I want you to read Joel chapter 2. And allow the Holy Spirit to begin to move in your life. And allow the Lord to begin to stir your heart again. And allow a hunger and a thirst to happen in your life. Because next Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, I want to believe something powerful is going to happen, not only to Open Door Church and those of you that are watching online, but I want to pray and believe, and I want you to pray and believe with me that something powerful is going to happen to the church worldwide. Because do we not need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Do we not need a revival of source? Do we not need God to come and do something special and something powerful and supernatural in the day we live? Because... Because the way things are, we're definitely floundering, aren't we? We're definitely desperate. We're definitely in need. We're definitely outside of where is a really, really good comfort zone for us as Christians. Pray this week with me. Read Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. And see if you don't see repeated repeated events of Acts 2. See if you don't see it. And then say, why have not I believed this? Don't be like King Agrippa. When King Agrippa was talking to Paul and Paul was preaching to him, King Agrippa said, Paul, you almost persuaded me. I don't want you almost to be persuaded. This is not horseshoes, folks. Come on. It's not, it's not just getting close. We want you to be a ringer. We want you to have a ringer for what God is saying in the scriptures. Hebrews 13 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if it happened in the book of Acts, it should be happening today. If it happened in the book of Psalms, it should be happening today. If it happened in the book of Exodus, it should be happening for us today. Whatever is in the scriptures should be happening to us today. We should know that it is still alive. So, Father, I come in Jesus' name, and I thank you for your word today. I thank you, Lord, that you are real. I thank you that you are eternal, that you're not just a, a, a passing God, that you just won't hear for the, that, that uh, 
death on the cross. You weren't just here for that resurrection. You just weren't here for that last 40 days. And then you weren't just here for the day of Pentecost. And then some historical stuff has happened since then. But you're here with us today. And you're the same God today as you were when you created the heavens and the earth. And God, even as you breathe into man, Lord, I pray that you breathe on us and breathe in us, Lord, that we might be revived and that, Lord, we might be filled. And God, that we would not be ashamed, Father, but we, Lord, experience everything you have for us according to your word in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Listen. Be, li be watching your Facebook, be watching your internet, uh, your emails, your Facebook, be wa checking your phone for text and stuff so that you're going to know what's happening next week right here at Open Door Church. So God bless you. We love you. If you'll just take your time and go out this way to my left, your right. And um, we love all of you. Thank you for coming out and for listening. Those of you online for listening, share.